Thank you very much. Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm the CEO of uh, Vixes Orca. We are uh, providing technologies for television uh, services providers, such as uh, content protection, service delivery platforms, content discovery, and end-to-end uh, -end multi-screen video solutions. And uh, so we have customers such as uh, Orange, Telecom Italia, uh, Telecom Romania, Canal Plus, Utelsat, among others. So I'm happy to have this opportunity to discuss with you some of the changes which are going to happen in the next four years in this, uh, in this area of television with a very strong impact of internet and mobile, uh, let's say, practices on this, uh, on the, on this world. So inter internet and, and, and mobile have met uh, for a few years and have created brand new user experiences which are highly immersive. The meeting point between television, internet and mobile have been also discussed for several years and it has, it has meant today solutions such as IPTV, or TV Everywhere, which have already dramatically changed the experience of television and video. But that's only the beginning. I believe the meeting point between television, internet, and mobile will move in the next, uh, in the next four years. And that's what I want to discuss for a minute. But to start with, what do I mean by an immersive experience? It's how many of you are currently checking Facebook? I'm sure several of you are doing it. And the immersive experience is that we are really connected to emails, Facebook, and various TV everywhere services, any, every, really everywhere. That immersive experience is a very, very strong change for the users, and it will impact this television industry. And I will go uh, through seven best practices from the internet and mobile world, which are going to transform television. I believe these practices should be highly inspiring for video services providers. I'm saying that they should be inspiring. I'm not saying that we should apply them to uh, the television world. Thus, this for two reasons. The first reason is that the television world, a big part of its value is coming from its editorial approach. And this editorial approach will continue to have a lot of value for the users. The second reason is that best practices are relevant according to business models. And most of what's going on today on the internet is based on free services, ad-funded services, while a lot of the video and television industry is based on paid-for content, meaning that best practices can be a bit different when we are changing the business model. They need to fit the business model. Anyway, uh, so let me start by the first one, which is create a personalized experience. A great example of that in the internet and mobile world is Google Now, and its ability not only to personalize, but also to predict the information which is relevant for you. And uh, in the field of television, the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the habit is completely different. We come from a world where it is broadcast. Someone chooses what everyone is going to see on Sunday night. It's quite the opposite of personalization. However, personalization has already stepped in in this television world through personalized recommendations. Many video services today are leveraging personalized recommendations. And that works. For instance, we have issued recently a case study with one of our customers yes, a DTH operator, on the impact on their video service of using recommendations. But recommendations is only the first step. There is a lot to create in the field of video to create a much more personalized experience, to be in a world where the service adapts to the user instead of today, 
It's up to the user to adapt to the service. You can imagine many ways to do it. You could get personalized notifications to be sure you don't miss programs you will love. You can imagine a fully uh, personalized uh, user interface with a look and feel which depends on you and your taste. You can think of a personalized linear TV channel. Or you can imagine that the categories uh, that which are used to choose the video on demand uh, or catch up uh, TV programs that you watch are personalized to you. So I believe that this is one of uh, an, a very inspiring trend to go for more personalization in the video world. The second best practice I want to discuss is about continuous testing. I refer here to, to approaches like A-B testing, you know, where you test two variants of your service with two subsets of your audience, you check the results, and you choose what works. It's what Netflix is doing a lot. They did it, for instance, when they moved from this uh, user interface, which was not that great, to this one, which actually, which actually people uh, prefer by far. But they built it for different A-B testing approach. And uh, I believe that Netflix users actually are involved in 30 to 50 A-B testing simultaneously. So Netflix is really testing always different variants of their, of their service. One in interesting point uh, I heard from the guys from Netflix was that what people do and what people say they do are actually quite different. And what matters for, for the business is in general much more what people do than what they say they do. And A-B testing is a great way to go to, to analyze what people actually do and go for the best evolutions of the service. That's a, a real change of mindset for such services to go for continuous testing in this way. The third best, uh, best practice I'd like to discuss is about the way to combine editorial and automated. The television world comes from an editorial approach. And uh, at first glance, editorial and automated don't fit well together. But when you look into it into more details, it's very complementary. First, because you can blend what comes from an editorial approach and what comes from an automated approach. Some editorial recommendations and personalized recommendations can be blended together. That works as long as you make sure that it is consistent, and it's consistent in terms of business model, for instance. But this complementarity goes much beyond that, actually. Because what, what's actually displayed to the users in any video-on-demand service today is the, the outcome of, a, of an algorithm. In all cases, it's automated in some way. You cannot manage thousands of programs without any automated algorithms. But how do they, these algorithms work? First, they implement business rules, which, which are, by nature, editorial. What do I mean here? For instance, you can say that um, so the, mo the movies which have entered your catalog in the last seven days and which have been successful in movie theaters should, should, uh, should be displayed in 25% of the cases. 25% uh, of uh, the screens should be for these specific movies, which are the most relevant ones. That's actually an editorial decision. Behind this, these algorithms crunch data. And a lot of this data are the metadata around the content. They are editorial by nature. And you know, there are companies which are investing a lot in building amazing databases of metadata about the different programs. So actually, you see, the, the, the best service will be the one to leverage the right business rules, which are editorial, the right metadata, which are editorial, and the customer data, and the automation, which delivers the best service. So that's where editorial and automated are really complementary. The fourth best practice is to open the wall gardens. As you know, the pay TV world, as a tradition, is in a wall garden. With the set-top box of a pay TV operator, you can only access to the programs of this pay TV operator. When you look in the internet world, things are done differently. 
can take the examples of Zappos with shoes, or here, the example of Amazon. These players are not only selling their products, they are also OK to open uh, to competitors' products when needed. Why do they do that? Because they want to make sure that each time you go to their service, you will find what you want as a user. If they can sell it to you, fine. They will sell their products. If they don't have it, they will uh, let you buy it from someone else. But for sure, next time you need something, you will go back to Amazon. And that's a philosophy which, which, which is also, I believe, relevant for video services. And since that's one of the challenges for the video services, to find the right way to open the world garden. Here we can look at what uh, Orange uh, did with its latest set of box in France, where this set of box uh, enables access, of course, to the uh, content which is licensed by Orange. It also enables access to uh, partners' programs from TF1, from Netflix, and so on. And in, it also enables a direct access to, inter to the services which are available on the internet. So it's a fully open set of box from this perspective. So the way to open the world garden is uh, one of the interesting challenges also for this uh, television industry. Let me move to the fifth um, best practice, which is keep it simple in terms of navigation. So since the iPhone arrived several years ago, the, your, so the user interfaces have changed dramatically, and people got used to very easy, intuitive uh, user interfaces. And we could expect entertainment and television to be one of the easiest things to navigate in. And it's not always the case. I mean, when we have the old remote control, the old EPG grid, the old VOD portals with categories and subcategories, we are not delivering such an easy navigation. And so that's one of the, one of the challenges also to build um, so the simple and easy navigation for these services which I believe will be mostly based on smartphones and tablets, which I believe will be also very, very much related to the metadata to help to navigate within, within the available content. Um, so, and it's also a matter of design of all these interfaces, of course. So in this area, if you wish to visit our booth on the Grand Via uh, Congress, seven, so 5C71, you, will, you can see some interfaces and the one of our voyage end-to-end -end solution. The sixth best practice is about sharing. So we all love to share, and we also, in, in particular, when it's about emotions, when it's about content, when it's about programs and television. We share a lot, and a lot of the traffic on Twitter is related to television. But what's it, what is funny today is that all this sharing about the television services is done in parallel to the television services. It's not part of the television services. And there is, a, there is an, an opportunity for uh, so the video services providers to embed this sharing as part of their service. It will, ma it will make the user experience of these services better for the end users. And it will also help them to gather a lot of information about the user's tastes and so on, which is very valuable for them. So the way, to, the, the, way, the way to share and to create actually communities around the video services is, I believe, also a great opportunity for, this, uh, for these players. The seventh best practice is about make it game. It's about gamification. Do you know who this guy is? is actually the one who reached 10 million miles with United. 10 million miles is something like 6,000 flights. I guess there are quite many frequent flyers in this room, but uh, I think most of us are kids compared to this, uh, to this guy in terms of uh, miles. And um, so I'm, I'm talking about him because actually frequent flyer programs are a very interesting example of gamification. And gamification is... Uh, uh, has been influential in the internet, in the mobile world, and I believe there is also a lot of potential for gamification in the field of TV. So you know, a frequent flyer program, it's about getting points when you fly, 
It's about getting your status, silver, gold, platinum, whatever, when you fly. And it's about a range of benefits that you can enjoy from your points and from your status. An important aspect of the status, for instance, is that it is visible from the others. It's social. The other travelers can see that you are in the fast track uh, of sky priority. You can, if, if, you can, if you can invite your colleagues or your family to the lounge, it has a lot of social value. Now, all these concepts, we can imagine different ways to apply them to the world of television. But um, here are many questions you can, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, raise. How to get points? Is it by watch, just watching TV? By rating, commenting? By answering quizzes or, or participating to games? Different ways to get, to get points. Another question is, which kind of status do, you want to, do we want to deliver to the, to the users? Personally, to be the one who is spending the longest time in front of TV every day is not a status that I would really enjoy. I don't, I don't feel it's so much, um, bringing so much value. I would be more interested to be recognized as an expert, maybe, in uh, soccer or in Game of Thrones. Or um, I could appreciate to be recognized as someone influential by uh, rating, sharing, recommending to others to be recognized as someone who influences uh, the marketplace and the usages. So we need to figure, so someone who wants to gamify television needs to figure out what is the right status, statuses. To make these statuses visible, a natural way is to connect this to the social networks, of course. And we need also to think of what, which are the benefits of getting points and of getting a status, which can be, of course, through three VOD, access to additional content, invitations to movie theaters, and so on and so on and so forth. This can be quite inspiring, I believe. We can also look for inspiration from other games. Uh, for instance, Farmville, which is an amazing example of creating a recurring usage. And creating a recurring usage is important for the video services as well, especially a la carte, but whichever the business model you want to create this recurring business model. So, you can look at Farmville in more details. Candy Crush is, uh, is, can be also a source of inspiration. How users are incentivized to promote this game on the social networks is quite interesting. How the random aspect of the game is making it more engaging is quite interesting as well. Um, the fact that you're rerouted as a user from the very beginning of the game is also a, an element uh, of its success. And uh, I don't know if the timeout concept uh, of 30 minutes you cannot use a game when you have uh, lost five times is something that could be relevant for some of the video services as well to make us more eager to, to, use, to use the service. So I believe that games can be an important part also to make the experience more engaging and more immersive. So to sum up uh, quickly this, uh, this presentation, so I wanted to introduce these uh, seven best practices, which I believe can be highly inspiring for video and TV services. And um, actually what matters behind these, uh, these practices, I believe, is how to create the most immersive experience for the end users. You know, um, I believe that the, the key challenge actually for the video services providers is about the user engagement. Because whichever the business model, what the video service provider monetizes is the engagement of the users. That's true with subscription business model. That's true with a la carte business model. That's true with ad-funded business models. It's all about user engagement. And a creative and immersive experience is an amazing way to create this engagement. And I believe there is a lot of uh, inspiration to look into these best practices for, so that Video service providers can create the most uh, engaging and immersive user experience, which means what? That the users will enjoy the services more and more, and that they will grow their business as well. So I thank you for your attention, and I think we have time for a few questions, uh, if you wish.
No question? Oh, there is one question there. Sorry. Yeah. One second. Yeah. I was intrigued by your suggestion of the keep it simple in the UI. And um, as someone who does linear TV on the internet and putting a lot of enhanced features around it, I know it's a huge challenge to try to get that much content on the screen at any one point at that in a way that's meaningful for the user. So I was curious if you had any specific recommendations on things that you'd seen either through the orange set-top box interface or the other examples you have at the booth that you thought were particularly impactful or wise ways of incorporating this much content. Okay, um, if I understood co correctly, so you want me to elaborate a bit on what, ma what makes an easy and simple uh, user interface for a TV, for a TV service? Yes, especially with interactive TV elements, if you saw any. So especially on the, on the, TV, on the TV set um, mm -hmm. side, 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 side of things. Sure. Um, so I believe, so in my, in my, in my eyes, um, the be so the, the, best, the best tool for this user is for the navigation, is eventually a smartphone or tablet. These touch screens are by far better than a remote control. On a remote control, you really need to make this as very, very simple. So with limited information that you display and limited navigation capabilities. It's, it's the easiest, so the simplest it will be, the easiest it will be for the user, and that's uh, fine. But it's, it's more limited in terms of interactivity compared to what you can do on a, on a, touch, on a touch screen. And um, yeah, my feeling is that the future will be to really interact through this second screen and use the main screen to enjoy the video by itself. But this is uh, the general direction that, uh, that we, we, will, we, will go, we will go for. And but to, to have a seamless experience between this uh, so the TV set and the second screen is an, important, is an important point. So you need to have an easy way to send the content to the TV set, you need to figure out which kind of additional data or additional information you offer to the user while he's watching a video on the main screen, what is relevant for, what is relevant for him while watching this program, and so on. So this, this is an area of research, I think, so for us and for the industry in general. Any other question? Yes. Um, could you share some thoughts if um, higher interactivity drives the possibilities of monetarization? Did you look into that? Excuse me, I, I, didn't, I didn't get your question. So. Um, does uh, higher interactivity um, empower the chances of monetarization in any way. So what, what, is, what is directly visible is all the content discovery part of the interactivity. So how do you help the user to find the content they will watch? And how do you help them to go for uh, paid for content and a la carte, a la carte content? And um, so here, so in this, in this area, uh, I invite you to have a look to the case study I referred to that we have published with uh, YES, where uh, YES explains what is the impact on the video on demand model to, to, use, to, use, to use recommendations and to help users to go for uh, paid for video on demand, which, is, which has a direct uh, business, business impact. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you very much uh, for, your, for your attention.